much for having me and it's a pleasure to be here today on a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, so my paper is on um, faith-based NGOs in Brazil and most specifically, more specifically on evangelical and I'll get to the why I'm talking about evangelical. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the beginning, a bit of history. Christianism is a founding pillar of Brazilian society. It was brought to the continent uh, by uh, the colonizing Catholic Church and who held a very strong and monopolistic uh, influence throughout colonial imperi empirical and Republican periods. Uh, it also must be understood as a grassroots movement in the, the very insane sense of Soter, uh, soteriological communitarian religiosity. Uh, and that in the context of the absence of the church as an institution in predominantly rural and isolated communities. So for hundreds of years, um, there were no, there were very, like Portugal is a very small country, very small Portuguese Catholic church not and brazil is a huge territory so there were not enough priests uh, or religious communities to uh, christianize um, and to make sure that everybody followed the christian dogmas for hundreds of years and which led to um, years of syncretism between catholicism indigenous and african beliefs and practices and it was only until the 19th century where the catholic the roman catholic church kind of woke up and realized that uh, what was being practiced in Brazil was not real Catholicism. And they, um, they made an effort, um, at least in, 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 ur in uh, urban communities, to re-Christianize, uh, re-Catholicize the population. Um, so even today, I'm going to skip to modern uh, 21st century, even in today's modern urban digitalized 21st century Brazil, Christianism, Christian, Christianism still permeates political and state institutions. And it's a major collective force and personal inspiration for the great majority of the, of the Brazilian population. Um, although Christianism has changed with the times, the Christian faith continues to be a guiding motivational force in Brazilian lives. That is irrefutable and anybody who's been to Brazil um, can feel the devotion, uh, the religious devotion of Brazilians um, towards their faith. Um, the ch and churches continue to multiply. I mean, because there's, a, there's this very living faith, uh, churches continue to multiply. And especially when I'm talking about um, evangelical uh, Pentecostal churches. Um, so you see them everywhere. I mean, literally, um, on every street corner. Um, and if you see anybody reading a book in the subway or in, uh, in a shop, good chances are it's the Bible. Um, so uh, churches continue to multiply. They're still full on Sundays, very different from North American Canadian, at least Canadian where churches are pretty empty on Sundays. Um, and religion is a constant and permanent force in the lives of both individuals and communities and religious institutions and leaders are considered the most trustworthy in their society. Much more trustworthy than uh, businessmen, than bankers, than politicians. Um, and Brazilian secular, sec secularism is presently undergoing a process of reconfiguration marked by the expansion of evangelical churches um, and other denominations, uh, Protestant denominations, and their growing influence in the public sphere and in the country's politics. Am I going too fast or I'm looking at the comments? Um, okay, we're good. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so now talking about faith-based organizations. Um, faith-based organizations have always been engaged in social development in Brazil, however, once again, the role has changed with the evolution and secularization of the Republican state and the modernization of society. You know, with that came the urbanization of society. 
Um, and although this paper acknowledges how faith-based NGOs in Brazil contribute to social development, it also I also try to demonstrate how within the context of the growing influence of evangelical churches, and when I talk about evangelical churches, I am referring to not only evangelical churches, but uh, the, uh, other denominations, um, Pentecostal, in, Bra in Brazil, everybody refers to them because there are so many denominations uh, as evangelical. Um, so their growing influence on Brazilian government and society, um, which can also contribute to the marginalization and disempowerment of vulnerable social groups and socio, it can also contribute to socioeconomic inequities. On a larger level, it also risks narrowing citizenship and chipping away at democratic institutions. And I will explain that further along in the paper. Um, I'm just going to start about um, to kind of to explain um, faith-based NGOs, their history in social development, their modern history. So if we go back to um, the 1960s, and this was a period of mass migration to urban cities, it was also a period of uh, military dictatorship, which, which lasted until 1985. And at that time, um, the faith-based faith, the faith, faith -based organizations and their implement, implement, um, involvement in social development what was went through liberation theology and liberation theology, which is, uh, you know, Roman Catholic. And it was rooted in the principle that human beings should be the subject of their personal destiny and history. It highlighted individual action and considered people to be the creators of history. And that through their participation in social movements, Christians could seek to understand specific issues, social issues, such as labor, uh, but also more general issues such as human rights in an effort to regain their human, their human dignity. So the idea was that, um, that the individual, and that means that could be somebody in a shanty town, you know, who works in a factory, um, who he, he or she has to be the actor of their history. And they do that through their involvement in social movements, through their involvement in their community, not only struggling for their own personal gain, their own personal dignity, but saying, OK, this is not only for me, it's for everybody. If I have the right to decent housing and um, clean water and transportation and a good paying job, everybody should have this right. So this is what Christianity is all about. Um, so the fundamental inspiration is that the Christian faith, which is experienced and understood as a transforming action in history. And the central factor that characterizes liberation theology is the importance it places on agency and how it considers people to be create, the creators of their own history and their collective history. So liberation theology greatly influenced both faith-based and secular civil, uh, civil society organizations in the 1980s. Um, and like this, this is um, a lot of they influence a lot of middle class educated people um, who had who held this Catholic faith, this Christian faith, based on liberation theology. That um, it was their um, their task to change society, to make society better, and that was based on their Christian faith. But it also influenced a lot of. Um, a lot of a lot of people from you know popular sectors, from shanty towns, um, factory workers, uh, mothers. Um, so, a good slice of the population. I mean, we're not in terms of in terms of the, the entire Brazilian population. No, it, it was pretty insignificant. But the influence they had uh, was enormous. Um, so, liberation theology really punched above its weight. Um, and during the 1970s and 80s, the to the Catholic Church formally opposed uh, the, the government, which was a dictatorship, and served as a hub for networks of social movements struggling to bring an end to authoritarian rule. The influence of liberation theology and the expansion of Catholic uh, uh, Christian ecclesiastic based communities, known as SEBs, created the basis for, for the growth of many social and political movements towards the end of the dictatorship and the beginning of the democratic construction. And a lot of these, these 
a lot of people that participated in them, they went on to participate in governments, they went on um, to be involved in policy um, programming and implementation, they went on to work in different uh, councils, uh, education, health councils. So even until today, so this, it's, it's, it's a really important legacy, uh, not only in terms of liberation theology, but in terms of a society, a social democratic society. Um, in addition, organized uh, church-based uh, popular groups sought to maintain the loyalty of parishioners by advocating for the poor in national poli politics. More recently, the nature of Christian institutions and communities has changed in the proliferation of evangelical and Pentecostal churches since the 1980s, uh, which today represents one third of Christians and one fourth of Brazilians. Uh, among other vocations, these churches seek a return to social standards, which they feel has been lost due to modernization and, pro and progressive and due to progressive social policies promoting diversity and the expression of minority identities, which they consider like anything that's LGBT, for example. Um, in their beliefs, uh, the latter goes against the ideal. Um, they feel that anything that's a minority expression, anything that's progressive, uh, goes against the ideal of the traditional, and I would say mythical, um, patriarchal family in Brazilian life in the sense that they see that as the father, uh, the father who has all the rights, all the privileges, decides everything for the family, the wife who is completely submissive to her husband and the children who are completely submissive to their father. Um, once again, this, it's an ideal. Um, it never was, uh, it never was the, the, the golden standard because in Brazil, you know, depending on social class, depending on race, there are different types of family. And even today, if we look uh, at Brazil today, 40% of families are headed by a female uh, breadwinner. So even today, that's not the typical mother, father, and children. That's not the typical family. Today, typical family is the mother, her children, and other dependents, which could be her mother, which could be her sisters. Um, so that's, but like I said, they, they feel that this is the ideal. This is the standard that, that, they, that existed, according to them, existed in the past and should still exist. So um, for evangelicals, the rhetoric of loss is based on the idea of a return to order, to safety and unity, a return to something that's been lost and gender roles and relation, relations and gender identities are an important arena for in which evangelicals and Pentecostals lament the loss of so-called traditional notions of gender and sexuality. In the past 10 years, evangelicals have politically organized, very successfully uh, organized themselves to wield influence on government policies and programs through alliances in Congress and the Senate, and more recently under the Bolsonaro government where they hold specific ministries. Uh, they are also politically active um, in the subnational levels, and man, many evangelicals hold office in state and municipal governments. A good example was the mayor of the city of Rio de Janeiro, huge city. And from 19, uh, from excuse me, from 2017 to 2020, it, the the mayor was an evangelical pastor and gospel singer, who subsequently got arrested for his involvement in a kickback corruption scheme and was not re-elected. He ran for office uh, last year. He was not re-elected. Um, okay. So these officials explicitly use their office to promote their evangelical and Pentecostal beliefs and values. Um, not only do they use their faith to attract voters, they are also setting the tone for a more conservative patriarchal and excluding country and society. They base their policy and lawmaking on their personal religious convictions. Um, so Brazilian evangelicals uh, have held, have had a similar influence on civil society in this period. And what's really interesting is that in the literature review that I did, there's a lot written on the influence, the political influence 
of evangelicals on, on policy on government, very little in terms of their influence on civil society. Um, but so I'm just going to go through a few examples of where and how they influence uh, civil society um, and through that government policy as well. So the role um, uh, of civil society organizations on governments and state policies and programs involves government subcontracting of program services to NGOs. So in Brazil, um, we, around the 1990s, uh, lo so especially local governments started subcontracting services and programs to NGOs um, with the idea that, well, these NGOs can do the job better and they're more embedded in the, in, in their, in the communities than government. So we can subcontract and you know, it's cheaper as well. You don't have to pay uh, a government employee with all the benefits and retirement plan and everything. And from the social civil society side, it was also seen as a bonus in the sense that it was, um, you know, it was um, feeding into NGOs, you know, NGOs, they have to be funded somehow. And um, especially at the beginning of the, of the 2000s, uh, international cooperation money started to dry up in Brazil. So, you know, the money had to come from somewhere to keep them, to sustain them. So they started taking on um, contracts, um, subcontracting services uh, for first for municipal governments and later on for uh, national, state and national governments. Um, so, um, so civil society and NGOs are also implicit, um, implicitly or explicitly under Christian influence because a lot of these NGOs, like I said, the ones that started in the 1980s, the Catholic ones, um, some of them are secular, some of them became secular, but the people who work there, they still, you know, they still, they are Catholics with, some of them are Catholics with belief in liberation theology. That's what, that's their founding, their founding beliefs. Um, and this is also observable in the number of Christian uh, non-governmental organizations, which is about 40% in Brazil. Uh, and many of them are sponsored by, are church sponsored. Um, and so the influence of uh, faith-based NGOs is present in the values of social justice and equality and their capacity to develop profound relationships with communities. This is really important. Um, most evangelical churches, however small they are, uh, they have their own social programs aimed at their parishioners and at the local community as well. And so the influence of these faith-based NGOs is reflected in the role in public services provision contracts that has, all, that has risen dramatically over the past few years as the state has outsour outsourced its services to civil society NGOs, some of them secular and some of them um, faith-based. Um, so strengthened by a dense network, these faith-based NGOs, especially the evangelical ones, they have a dense network and an army of volunteers, very faithful volunteers. And they also benefit um, from a strong trust. Like I said, uh, po the population trusts religious uh, figures. Um, and so these faith-based NGOs invest in sectors of social education, health, education, and human rights defense. And by offering even more diverse, diversified services to their faithful on the one hand, but they also gradually to the whole community, these organizations outsource the services of the states, offering an alternative to an incomplete and deficient public service. By becoming aware of its strength and uh, influence, uh, this religious vol voluntary service is gradually being built as a potential social substitute. Um, for the state, especially when the latter is overwhelmed by uh, concurrent social crises like we see now. So a few examples, um, health campaigns uh, in the, from the, the National Min the Ministry of Health relied on faith-based organizations. Um, and these organizations fulfilled a role of information relays or transmission that they informed the population about certain health issues, what to do, what not to do. Um, and they also pulled out government program. They also planned out government programs, implemented government programs, uh, which called out, that this called on all religions, uh, Catholic, Evangelical, Adventists, uh, Afro, Afro-Brazilian, pretty much the, the government realized that if we want to get our message out, if we want to prevent uh, certain diseases, we have to rely on these religious communities. 
Um, and Brazilians uh, often precisely located in, in risk areas. You know, it's very hard, who are hard to get to. So the uh, religious communities uh, are very useful in this. Another example of this kind of government outsourcing program involved drug um, addiction prevention and treatment. Faith-based NGOs created over 3,000 rehab centers. Um, and this was a statistic from, 19, uh, from 2011. Um, and they worked on social professional integration of former addicts. Uh, in addition, many of these organizations provided services around drug use prevention among youth. Um, and many of them received funding from national and subnational government. And they were based on religious affinities, um, which has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, so in there is a, there was a pickup, and I do not have statistics about this, but uh, from what I'm reading, there was a pickup in the number of um, contracts between the federal government and uh, evangelical NGOs. And this came about with the election of in, 19, in 2019 of Jair Bolsonaro. Um, when he named, he named uh, an evangelical pastor and professional lobbyist, Dalmaris Alves, to be the Minister of Women, Family and Human Rights. And this is not the first time that um, evangel an evangelical um, politician has been involved in human rights. Um, in, in the last 10 years or so, there have been elected evangelical officials, um, for example, in the National Commission on Human Rights. Um, at one point in 2013, it was a pastor who was the president of this commission. And he insisted on putting forth a traditional definition of family that excludes same-sex couples. Um, so now we have, since, since 2019, a evangelical pastor who is the minister of um, family, uh, women, family, and human rights. And during her mandate, she continued to fund evangelical faith-based NGOs, outsourcing services around, around, especially around mental health issues. Um, and the complex relationship between the Brazilian state and its civil society partners is perhaps best understood in the context of this growing uh, permeability of the religious and political spheres and in the tendency of both parties to use this relationship to their own end. On the one hand, politicians do everything they can to obtain more favorable uh, electoral results. They want to be elected. Um, and on the other hand, religious actors seek to take advantage of this association with the, with the government to influence po the political sphere on issues that are important to them, such as reproductive rights, marriage, family law, and education. Uh, in terms of social development led by faith-based NGO NGOs, um, there are contradictory ways uh, religious values are central to the mission of these NGOs and how notions of care and gender advanced by these organizations who, seem ch who are charitable, who, who seem charitable, are limited by engendering social uh, transformations and can promote gender inequity and exclusion of the L LGBTQ plus uh, uh, individuals and minorities. Um, my definition of a faith-based NGO is a development organization whose membership and core values are motivated by faith, noting the manner in which faith embeds itself in the work of the organization separates it from its secular counterparts. Um, and this can contribute to the reproduction of heteronormative and patri patriarchal social dominance. Um, and I'm going to give an example now involving uh, faith-based NGOs who work with women, uh, with violence against women. Um, and I just want to see, um, in terms of time, am I good? Okay, great. Um, you still so have about Brazil, 10 minutes. Fantastic. Okay. I'm not going to need all that. So. Um, in Brazil, many women suffer from terrible poverty, um, like I said, many of them are are um, are household are heads of households, so they have to they raise children themselves. They have to take care of others, um, and they and those who are in couples they face violence in the home as well as high levels of urban violence surrounding them. It's not a pretty picture. 
Um, mothers are expected to care for their children, this feeding into a Christian base and cultural view of the mother as selfless and giving regardless of the structural hardships, including poverty and violence, um, as well as high levels of machismo and control over women based on gender norms. There is a strong focus on the family, as I mentioned before, um, in the Christian faith and in Brazilian Christ Christianity, there's a very strong focus on the family and the submission of women's needs and safety in favor of family unity and harmony, meaning that women's sense of identity and subjectivity is mediated through their gendered normative role as, as wife, mother, and carer of the family. The attachment of faith-based organizations to their religious norms and codes as a source to drive social change constrains the understanding of how their understanding of how the social work works, how things actually go down, <laughs> and limits their ability to find appropriate responsive and solutions to social, economical, and political problems. Um, because conservative Pentecostal groups tend and evangelical groups tend to interpret the Bible in a very literal manner and focus heavily on the importance of female submission to the male partner, this can leave women highly vulnerable to domestic violence. And this conservative view of gender influences uh, the way in which violence is understood and the solutions proposed for addressing violence. For example, in the use of, by a faith-based NGO of mediation as a strategy to reduce violence and improve domestic relations. According to Brazilian law, which is fairly recent, um, a woman has the right to go to the police and denounce her husband if she is a victim of domestic violence. And that is highly encouraged uh, because it's, a, it's an unequal relationship. She's on you know, the weaker end of the stick. So that's why it is encouraged. But uh, faith-based faith NGOs, what they suggest is, well, maybe we should do mediation. He didn't mean it. He was, uh, he was very angry. Uh, you must have done something to provoke him. Let's sit down. Let's work it out for the sake of the family. So they're subjecting the woman's safety for the unity of the family, and you know, and her and, and you know her well-being. So this is one example where where the Christian faith and their their, their religious beliefs um, don't propose a very viable solution to all the. Uh, the actors implicated in the situation. Um, so, as I said, the use of faith-based and years of mediation as a strategy to reduce violence and improve domestic relations, relations but, you know, in the long run, uh, most of the time things get worse before they get better. Um, in many cases, this means that, if anything, mediation without denunciation uh, to the police leaves an abuser in a greater position of power unconcerned that he would have to suffer legal or any kind of punitive outcome for the violence committed against his partner. And a woman's right to live without violence is subordinated to a focus on the family unit uh, in which so-called traditional gender roles are supported uh, as are gender relations which uphold patriarchy and the importance of the male in the home and his dominance in the home. So that's one example, and it's it's um, it, it's uh, re original research by uh, Viceno uh, from 2019, and even in her own research, she said there's a lot more that can be explored on this subject because she feels that she did a um, an empir one empirical case study, but she feels that um, there's a lot more implication of faith-based NGOs um, in outsourcing these services. Um, to uh, women who are victims of violence. Okay, I'm gonna go to the conclusions now. Um, the, gr the growing influence of evangelical NGOs in Brazil takes place within a larger context of their increased participation in public life and occupation of public spaces in the media, in culture, and in politics. So this is not isolated. This is a one piece in the puzzle. Along with their well-developed mission of social and community development, faith-based NGOs also aim at increasing public visibility of their religion uh, by occupying spaces and influencing norms and values. So this is a lot about being 
a very important actor within their communities and occupying public space uh, pr by providing services. Um, however, the worldview and representations around social relations can also take the form of uh, excluding certain interests and voices uh, concerning women's reproductive rights, domestic violence, the LGBTQ plus community, and also other religions. Um, because contrary to Catholicism, where you can have some kind of synchronism, uh, synchronism uh, this is impossible um, for evangelicals and Pentecostals, where they see um, Afro-Brazilian uh, religions as, the, an, as, as, as an enemy, not even an adversary, as an enemy. And this has led to violence against, um, against these religions and, uh, and their, uh, their faithful. So coupled with it, you have to say, I, I'm trying to look at faith-based NGOs and especially evangelical NGOs within the context of what is going on um, today in Brazil. So coupled with the evangelical influence on the public sphere, uh, on the political sphere, ex excuse me, on the political sphere, the presence of um, evangelical ministers, you know, important ministers around social services, um, in commissions, in national commissions, also in terms of their where they where they're very well placed in municipalities as councilmen, as mayors. Um, this has and also in media because um, evangelical and Pentecostal churches they also have an important control on the media. If you are driving through rural Brazil, you have the choice between uh, evangelical radio station. <laughs> or a country radio station, uh, that's about it. <laughs> so, and that's the same is for TV as well, uh, in terms of cable TV that they, they own quite an important number of cable TV stations are very present on TV. And as of a few years ago, they're also very present on social media. Um, so taking all this together, they can see that there is a, an increase in their influence in society in societal values and norms um, because of this triangulation. Um, so when I was going through and I was doing my literature review and looking um, at you know, the studies that are taking place in Brazil, what I noticed was that most studies on religion today in Brazil focus on the phenomena of secularize, secularization or how secularization is happening or not happening or going back and forth. Um, or there's a, quite a few uh, studies on the influence of evangelicals on politics or on social media. There were very few studies on the influence and role of evangelical faith-based NGOs, uh, which was quite, I found quite surprising. Um, and on the issue of their outs their, the outsourcing and how they participate in the outsourcing of social um, social services, I only found a few, um, a few empirical studies. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of space um, to cover how this influence is taking out at a grassroots level um, and how it coalesces also with the influence at a higher political level. Um, so this paper, this was a very modest paper. <laughs> Aimed, that aimed at exploring uh, these issues using secondary sources as well as important uh, the literature on desecularization uh, in Brazil. And my conclusions are that this is, it's, it's a very important theme and considering that right now, um, ev the evangelical churches, they, have re they really do have a momentum um, politically and social, socially, so I think it's really important to study what kind of impact this has, um, not only on social policy, but also how this plays out uh, at the grassroots. And thank you very much.